OK, welcome back for the RNA seq tutorial part of this section. This module. And let me go ahead and just jump right into the slides. There is another PowerPoint uh, in in the Canvas module. And we're going to heavily use Galaxy today. The, the whole analysis will be in Galaxy. Uh, and although there are only 10 slides in the PowerPoint. Uh, it may take time. Uh, right, the, the steps, there aren't that many steps involved, but some of them are going to take a while. So it, it'll be one of those things where you execute and then you have to wait for Galaxy to run the job. OK. So you should have already uh, from the the last step in the GBA section where we had to go convert the GenBank file into a genome flat file, so the GFF file, you should have created a Galaxy account and you should have a link there or or uh, it's very easy to get to. You just type use Galaxy uh, and, and that's where we're going to start. So see if I can get both of these arranged on the screen. Oops. OK, so first step is to get the data. I already put the data that you'll need for this in a Galaxy history. And this is one of the cool features of Galaxy. I talked about how you can share histories and things like that, but this, it's also one way for me to share data or, or you to share data on a project is once you've logged into Galaxy, if you go into right here, there's a shared data tab. And if you do shared data histories, I'm going to hope. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and then you can search on my username and you'll get the histories that I have shared. OK, so. The RNA seq tutorial 2021, that's what we're going to do. So if you click on that. You'll see the data sets that are involved. So here I've given you eight uh, fast Q files. So these are. Um, Illumina reads from eight different samples and then you go over to the plus sign and click that oh and you, you will actually <laughs> that's the one that i already had loaded so it skipped right over it but you should get to a, a page that lets you name the history and then you'll want to select import uh, to import that history since it belongs to me it it went straight to the page okay so you'll you want to name it and you can leave the name the same. You don't have to rename it, um, but then just click that import button and you should get to something that looks like this, where now you have all eight of those. Data sets that are now in your history. OK, so they've, they've you you've copied the data. And you can do whatever you want with it. it, it so if I deleted these right now, it wouldn't affect what you have copied into your history. Um, if you delete it, it won't affect what's copied into my history. Uh, so they're there. Yeah, it doesn't really. I was going to explain what's going on in the back end, but that doesn't really matter. All right, so next step, once you got the data is to create some data set collections. So I've given a link here. Um, I enable that on mine. might have to play this. Yeah, so <laughs> they got some cool jazz to go with it, uh, but this is going to teach you how to make a data set collection. You can see this is actually a tutorial that's using very similar data to ours, although I haven't imported all of the, the read sets for ours just to, to help things go faster. OK, so you want to Follow along through this. You, you'll need to pause the video just like you pause mine to do it. Um, but go through that. 
Let's. There we go. And once you do that, let me jump over to. What, so. What what that tutorial is going to do. Is teach you how to. Make a collection out of these things, and that's going to save you a lot of time and the potential to make errors in terms of which comparisons you're making uh, downstream. This data has two conditions, so C1 and C2 are the two conditions. Then you've got uh, read one and read two, uh, or sorry, replicate one and replicate two, and then the reads, instead of being labeled one and two, they're forward and reverse, okay? So just to um, give you an indication what these file names mean. So that's condition two, replicate one, forward, condition two, replicate one, reverse. And so th that's the paired end reads. Which one is the forward read? Which one is the reverse read? That's just like saying read one, read two. Okay. All the forward and reverse depend on which library tech you're using. So in this case, it's the same as read one and read two. Making that, I'm gonna jump over to the history where I've already done all that. You can pause the video here, wa pause my video, watch the Galaxy video from the PowerPoint to learn how to do it. I'm gonna jump over to a history where I've already completed those jobs. And what you're gonna see is <clears throat> down here at the bottom, I named mine C1 and C2, and C1, right, it consists of condition one, replicate one, and condition one, replicate two, and I can kind of dig down within uh, replicate two here, I've got forward and reverse, so then we could look at that data, right, so I've got my Illumina data there, so I can dig down into that, but at the end, I've got Two history items here. One is for condition one and one is for condition two. That's what you should have by the end of this section. Just on my history, it's step nine and ten. If you make mistakes, that's okay. You can always delete history items. Um, so what that's going to do is mean your history numbering will be out of sync with mine, but that that's okay too. You just need to have condition one and condition two uh, at the end of step two there. Step three is our mapping. So we're going to use a program called HiSat2. So let's search HiSat. And go to the HiSat2 page. And here I've given you markers that show all of the things that you may need to modify. So we're going to use a built-in genome. We need to modify this. And so you can actually, the fastest way to get here is to type in DM3, because this is built on the Drosophila melanogaster version three genome assembly. And we have paired end data set collections. Paired collection C2 and C1. Doesn't matter which order you do these in, okay? I would, you know, for me, I would do C1. I, the, the screenshot was C2, but you have to do them both either way. The order doesn't necessarily matter, okay? I don't actually know if this data is stranded or not, so I'm gonna leave it unstranded. There's no harm in leaving it unstranded. Um, it's going to map to the the orientation of the reads. So, if you had stranded data um, and you use the unstranded algorithm, uh, it should still map to the the right strand. If you use stranded then it's going to all, it's going to force it to try to map to the sense strand on all the proteins, right? So if, if it doesn't map to a, um, 
a sense the sense strand of the protein, it will throw those reads out in most cases. I think that's what high sat two does. It'll it'll report that, but you know how how many of them didn't map, but that's the difference there. Since I don't know, I'm going to leave it unstranded. I'm going to use default options for the paired ends. And so, right, so if you look, as long as you've got those four things correct, you can click execute here. And what that will do is these two jobs right here will pop up and they'll be gray. Well, so actually only one of them. So you'll hit execute. That'll start a job. Then you're going to have to go here, switch that and execute again. That will generate the two BAM files. So you've got it on collection nine, which is condition one, and collection 10, which is condition two, right? So that's our read mapping. And that could take a long time. So these may stay gray for a while, and then they're gonna turn yellow or that orangish yellow color um, that will tell you that they're running. Once they finish, if they finish uh, like the job completes the way it should, it will turn green. If there's a problem, like the job fails, it will turn red. And just to, so, right, you have an idea what's going on here. We could be running this on bridges too. All, and in fact, I don't know the back end, it, it varies. Uh, I don't think it says it down here, but a lot of the back end for Galaxy, like where is the computation actually being done? That could be in Austin, it could be in Pittsburgh, and any of those exceed machines are, are potentially being run. A lot of them are run in, in the Penn State machines and the, the Pittsburgh machines. Um, and then the, the ones in Indiana and Austin uh, are the the next two big ones where it might be the, the physical computing might actually be uh, getting accomplished. Sometimes job resource parameters allow you to specify the resource. And so for this one, you could say, oh, hey, yeah, run this on Stampede 2. Now, I'm going to let it find its own. I'm going to let the use the default because what it will do by default is look at what's the fastest resource and the one that's not, it's going to minimize your wait time. If you think about, okay, if I specify Skylake, because I know Skylake will run faster than Knight's Landing. Okay, that's the, hopefully you remember back to the exceed section. I talked about the difference between these two. It will run faster on this, but there's probably going to be a longer wait time because there aren't nearly as many Skylake nodes available. And uh, so, there's no no reason uh, necessarily to to specify that, but you can uh, specify the compute resource. Okay, so then you've executed both of those high sat jobs. Go on to the next step. Although it may you may well have to wait, quit that, do something else for a while, come back, find out if your high sat jobs are done. One of the other cool things about um, Galaxy, though, is that we don't have to wait for those jobs to be done in order to complete subsequent steps. We can queue them up, and Galaxy will complete them in order. So we need to get some data from another resource. So the UCSE, that's University of California at Santa Cruz, maintains a genome browser that has genome flat files for lots of model systems. So we're going to go up here and queue up some of the next steps because this the next thing is just going and getting uh, the genome flat file. If you remember from our visualization thing, the IGV that we did, uh, the last step of GVA, so visualization, we had to generate a genome flat file. And the purpose of that was 
telling it where the features were, where the start and the stop of the exons and, and all that information. We need to get that for our reference genome, uh, the, the Drosophila melanogaster assembly three. We need the flat file that says where are all the, what positions are all the features, okay? That way we know where the genes are when we go to map. Okay, so I'm gonna go here, click the get data, and I'm gonna go down here, UCSC main table browser. Okay, so I get to this page, and since I've been here not that long ago, these are all probably set. Yeah, these are set because it's cached in my browser, but make sure that you set all of these and be careful because if you download the wrong thing, things are gonna fail. So, I don't know why my mouse keeps freezing. So here, make sure that the information matches, right? We've gotta be in the insect clade, Drosophila melanogaster. We have to be using the April 6th, um, I can't remember what the B is. This is the uh, Drosophila genome reference panel, um, but it's assembly three. Uh, there's no way that you would know this a priori. Like, I know that this is what the the, the right one to use um, based on the data that we have. Okay, so mapping to this, this is the right assembly based on the samples that we have. Okay. There, there's nothing universal about the choices here. Um, it's specific to this tutorial, this project. Um, we, the group that we want in our genome flat file are the genes and gene predictions. We're going to get the fly base genes, not the RefSeq ones. That's a little bit arbitrary because we're not doing anything downstream of them, but this way everybody's output looks the same, right? So here, flybase, we could do any gene set that's listed here. Um, the, the default is usually the, the RefSeq genes, the other NCBI names. Here, we're gonna get the flybase gene names and the table, right? I'm not sure if that goes back to default flybase gene or not. But just make sure that that top section all matches. Then we're going to go here, our output format. We want GTF, the gene transfer format, which is similar to GFF, okay? Just slightly different information, different format of the file. It's not different information, really. It is just different format. Um, and then click Get Output. And when it when you click Get Output, it even gives you an option. Since we came here from Galaxy, it says ten, send query to Galaxy. So click that and I'm not gonna do that because I don't want another one in my browser. But if you click send to Galaxy, you will see my history item number 17 will pop up where it says, UCSE main on D melanogaster fly base gene. Okay, and just to look at what is that? What did we just download? Right, looks very much like the GFF file that we uh, used before. It's just the columns are a little bit different. And obviously different species, but. Before we, we had an E. coli genome. So, okay, so next step, and uh, hopefully by this time your high sat jobs have turned yellow, if not green already, but um, we can keep going. Next, the GTF file that we get from UCSC main has this, it's not a weird notation, it's just that the, the tool we're gonna use for quantification doesn't like the periods uh, in the strand information, uh, not strand, the frame information. So right, uh, codon could start in frame zero, one, or two. But 
right? Three base pair codons. If you don't know where the start is, you might be translating in frame zero, one, or two. Um, the I think if, um, yeah. So the dot here is unknown in the UCSC main uh, annotation for this. So we need to get rid of the dots. And this isn't going to affect our um, mapping at all because the mapping doesn't really care what the reading frame is. It's just going to count up how many reads aligned to that part of the genome, or in this case, that protein. Okay. So the reading frame doesn't really matter here. And so we can just go ahead and get rid of all those dots. How do we do that? Well, there's a tool in here. If we go to filter and sort, so that, and then we filter, we're gonna, which one are we gonna filter? Oops. So I've got that single data set selected. And we're going to select the UCSC main. Let me go back here so you can see following the slide. And then this statement is column seven. And you can you can look and confirm this on your own. That's how I did it the first time. What this is saying is for column seven, everything that's not equal to, to a period we're going to we're going to keep okay so it's going to get rid of all those lines with a dot And then you click execute and you should get my job, my uh, history item number 18, where it says filter on data 17. Now, I think I pointed this out before, but you can always edit attributes if you want to call these history items something that makes more sense. For my purposes, uh, I'm just going to leave it as it is. All right. So this next step, six, you're not going to be able to do until HiSat finishes. Right now, 17 and 18 didn't really depend on HiSat being done. HiSat is creating the BAM files, just like when we did GVA, right? So that's our all, all of our reads aligned. The next thing we want to do is to actually count. So how many reads are mapped to each position? This is sort of the analogous step in genome variant analysis was the M pileup, right? Now we're going to count how many reads and in M pileup was the step for calling variants where it looked at, OK, how many reads are there and it's going to try to figure out what's the probability well m pile up and call are going to figure out what's the probability that this is a true variant htseq is going to look at how many reads map to each position and and basically uh, give it a count okay so search tool htseq so htseq count okay Going to have to, whoops, so here, data set collection. Here, data set collection. Now, I don't think before high set finishes, I don't think these will pop up, but you click data set collection there, and then you're going to have to do this just like we had to do, run the mapping for each condition. We have to run the counting for each condition. So you're going to have to do this twice, once for the one the high sat on collection one uh, condition one one for the high sat on condition two so I sat on condition nine that's my BAM file 
and then my GFF file. I can never remember whether it's single data or collection data. So if you ever don't see a thing pop up in your drop down, you can always check the other one. So like for the, the BAM file was in collections because it's on a collection data, I kind of get it. I just always forget. Um, the GFF file though is filter on data 17. So I know that's my filtered uh, GTF file. Here, I'm going to let this do the counting based on stranded information. I don't really, things that mapped to the antisense somewhere, I don't want to count those because I'm not really confident um, that they mapped to the right place. Um, so in this case, stranded information, I'll keep when I'm doing the counting. And then there are a bunch of advanced options that we could set just to show you just to show you them, but um, the the main one, and we're going to leave it as the default, is what do you do with the different modes of um, how reads map to multiple genes or multiple transcripts. This is really the, the isoform issue, uh, even though they're being called genes here. And there are three options, union, intersection strict, and intersection non-empty. And it tells you how is the read going to be reported or mapped based on how it fits in these various uh, potential scenarios of overlap. Okay. And <clears throat> oh, that's up here in mode. That's not even uh, advanced options. Sorry, to make that more confusing than it needs to be. But right, these are the union intersect. And so the default is union. That's the most common way because here, well, I won't walk through it uh, step by step, but at least as a first approximation, union is kind of what you would expect or want a read to the way you would want it to be counted in most cases. Okay, and then you just click execute, right? So the, really the only things you've changed are telling it the two files. All the rest of these are, are I think, are, are set by default. Um, And click execute and then go ahead once that's executed you'll see it turn up gray over here and it's going to actually create two different history items one that says no feature and one that has the feature so one is ignoring the the gene names but um and then the second do that for the second one so you'll generate two more htc count history items Step seven is where we're actually going to calculate the differential expression. So now we've got counts. This is a summary of what happened for um, condition two, read one, for example, from HTC count. This is how many times, right? Most of the reads hit no feature, kind of weird. Um, so get some ambiguous ones, some ones that are too low quality and so on. Actually, did I click the, oh, that's the no feature table. That's why I thought that looked a little weird. Let's go back here. Just to give you an idea. Okay, so yeah, so this is the one where it, it knows the features. I was thinking that looked really weird. So this is our gene ID, right? That's Those are fly-based gene IDs, and this is the count. So you can see most, this is kind of where I was talking about, there's negative binomial. Vast majority of genes have zero expression. That was going so fast, you can't even see the ones that do, but here, right? 
there's a, a gene very highly expressed. But this is that negative binomial. Vast majority of genes have no or low expression. Okay, so that's what we have now after the uh, HTC count. So we have that for condition one and condition two and each of the replicates. Now we need to calculate statistically which of these have differential expression. Um, and that's where DEC2 comes in. So go over here. You can search for DEC2. There it is. These are things that you'll, you, there's, um, it's up to you what you want to call these, but the factor, these are like uh, naming your experimental treatments in, in some sense. So you are, you are in some ways, it, you know, what are the things you want to compare? So we have a factor called condition, and then we have condition one, and factor level two is condition two, and condition one, this is where you have to be careful and why some it, it is sometimes better to rename data or history items along the way. Like if I hadn't done this in a very specific order, I wouldn't be sure which one was which. I know that HCC count on collection 11, that is my condition one results. Okay, and then down here, right? clicked on the individual data sets, HTC on collection 14, that is my condition two data. Okay, and that's on the slide, what I mean by be sure these match is condition one needs to match your counts for condition one. When you name condition two, you need to make sure they match with the condition two output from HTC count. And that's really all you need to change. Um, again, you've got, there are advanced options uh, for modifying the, some of the details of the statistics. There's some background there. Um, th there's just no way for me to cover, and it's really not the focus of the, the course of to um, get into the, the um, all the possible ways you might need to modify this for your particular experimental design um, that would that would be too much we would never um, sort of get the actual logistics of how to do it done uh, and so here just i'm saying that as a big caveat to if you're doing this for research uh, i'm talking mainly to the phd students here doing rna seq there's a lot of additional reading that you'll need to do or meeting with me or whatever to talk about it, uh, specific specifics of experimental design. Also going to talk about this more for the final projects where we are really doing this for real research. Um, but uh, just a huge caveat before you're about to hit execute and just run this thing with all the default parameters. Um, okay, so do execute and you should see the DEC2. Um, two history items will pop up. One that's going to be the table of results and one that is going to be a plot of results. Okay, so again, all of these steps, the counting, the DEC2, uh, they're going to take a while. You can, uh, so even if HTC count hasn't finished yet, you can queue these up. I'm pretty sure these populate even before the job finishes. So you can have a whole pipeline waiting to be done uh, and then you know go away. You can close your browser down uh, because Galaxy's not going to forget that it needs to do those jobs. That's just like submitting a Slurm job when we were on Bridges 2. Uh, you've submitted those jobs. Galaxy will do them as soon as the resources are available. Once that finishes, right, you're going to see uh, 
the table output will look something like that. Okay, and that's it's a matter of hitting the eyeball to look at what's in there. Um, so your genes, and then all the sort of standard statistics about the the log two fold change, the mean variance, standard error, the p value. So is and these p values are between condition one and condition two because those are the factors we told it to compare. So is it, you know, you have to look at the mean of the individual um, conditions to know higher or lower. Uh, can we tell that from? Not from the ones that I have here. Um, oh, and also you're not going to be able to tell for an individual gene. Um, let me go. been a while since I actually looked at that. So you might have to go back to the counts to see on a per gene basis, which is higher or lower. This, but for example, sorting on the p-value would give you an indication of the subset that are differentially expressed. And then you could go back to the counts to see the directionality of that significant change. Um, the plots, switch over to that. I, I gave two examples there, because those are the main two that you, they give you information about the difference in the samples. You can see that sample one uh, and two are clustered well on one principal component. So this is a principal component analysis that automatically gets run uh, by default by DEC2, telling you there's big separation between the two conditions condition, uh, based on PC1. So 57% of the variation in genome-wide transcript levels is explained by the condition. So that's a lot. That, but you also have PC2, which there is variation between replicates within conditions that ex is also explaining a, a bunch of the variation. It doesn't seem directional, right? Replicate 2 for the condition 1 is, ho is higher or more like replicate 1 from condition 2. So um, there's, I, I have no interpretation because I don't know the background of the experiment or the design or any of that stuff. Um, you could go back and look through this paper um, if you're really interested in what might be going on. Um, the, the main point here is if you can get to this end point, you can do a very um, quick and dirty it, well, maybe not even quick and dirty. You you can do RNA seq analysis. You could get a first pass um, analysis of what's different between these two conditions. Which genes are differentially expressed? That's this table shows you exactly which genes are differentially expressed. It looks like there might actually only be. one gene that is significant. Yeah, at least at uh, 0 0.05, 0 0.0 anything. Most of the other are just not differentially expressed. And you can see that's the only, well, oh no, it doesn't have a ton of reads, but uh, the fold change is not even twofold. So, OK, uh, that's it for this tutorial. Um, hopefully we can get through that uh, in class, and that'll be the foundation for uh, where we go with uh, group projects, which are going to be a, another RNA-seq experiment in looking at sex bias expression.